Welcome back to Tipping Point. I'm your host, Kara McKinney. How many votes do you think it takes to sway an election? A few thousand or even maybe less than that? Look at the House race in New York's 17th District in November. Republican Assemblyman Mike Lawler defeated Democrat incumbent Sean Patrick Maloney by 1,787 votes. This is one of the many reasons why Judicial Watch, a nonprofit specializing in voting rights, fights for election integrity nationwide. And it announced today that it is settling a federal election integrity lawsuit against New York City. The suit was filed after city officials removed over 440,000 ineligible names from outdated voter rolls. Filed under the National Voter Registration Act, the organization seeks to bring attention to an issue issue that may impact the outcome of local and national elections. The suit claims that New York City only removed 22 names from their list over the course of six years. And the city plans to do more now going forward. So for their part, as a result of this lawsuit, the city has announced a plan to monitor voter roll maintenance through 2025. Of course, this action should have come long before a lawsuit had to be filed. Removing voters who have moved, died, or failed to confirm their information is mandatory under state laws of 2018 via a ruling by the Supreme Court. Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton had this to say, quote, This historic settlement is a major victory for New York voters who will benefit from cleaner voter rolls and more honest elections, end quote. Several other lawsuits filed this year in states ranging from California all the way to Maryland have resulted in long overdue voter roll cleanup. In February of this year, Judicial Watch settled a lawsuit in North Carolina after state officials removed 430,000 inactive names from their rolls. And one can't help but wonder why these states wait until after elections to clean up the voter lists. Joining us now to discuss is Robert Popper, a senior attorney for Judicial Watch. Thanks for being here tonight, Robert. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Great. So looking at this issue broadly, how do bloated voter rolls make room for, for corruption when it comes to these elections, necessitating the need for them to be cleaned up? Well, they can corrupt elections in several ways. You can have uh, double voting, intentional double voting. Uh, you can have accidental sending of excess, you know, particularly in the era of COVID, excess ballots, um, mail-in ballots to addresses of people who've moved out of state. I mean, look, the issue really, in a way, can be traced back to the passage of the National Voter Registration Act in 1993. And the idea was, it's more popularly known as the Motor Voter Bill, Bill Clinton's Motor Voter Bill. If people can register at departments of motor vehicles, that's fine, provided that registration lists are cleaned up on a more regular basis. And that second part of the equation of the deal has been fought tooth and nail by Democrats now for decades, um, starting in the Clinton administration, but proceeding up to the present day. I used to work at the Department of Justice, and the DOJ voting section is charged with bringing lawsuits under this statute, and they don't. I was there when it was a controversial occurrence, but one of the leaders of that division said that they were not interested in pursuing that kind of lawsuit. And it shows when they don't pursue that kind of lawsuit, it's left to private groups like us. Now, we've managed to have, I am proud to say, an outsized impact just by virtue of the fact that states understand that we're serious, uh, that we can bring these lawsuits, that we know how, and that we're not going away if we think someone is shirking their their duty to clean their voter rolls uh, following a, a huge spate of uh, registrations. So as you're saying, the DOJ is not as proactive as they should be, so kind of wink, wink on that. Uh, but also, you, Judicial Watch in this uh, settlement, looking at some of the numbers, I think I mentioned it earlier about how New York City over a, a six-year period only removed 22, 22 from the, the voter rolls, 22 people, uh, and looking that there's 5.5 million voters there. So, I mean, that is such a, a, a small, small fraction. So cities like the Big Apple, do they get away with it? Because A, as you mentioned earlier, they know the DOJ is not necessarily going to come sniffing around for them. The DOJ is too busy going after uh, concerned parents at school board meetings or, you know, some of these other uh, shenanigans they've been polling. Uh, but do you think it's also because there's, they know these issues get so wrapped in litigation that, as you said, there's a lot of left-wing legal activist groups that may come to their, their aid and their benefit. Do you think that's maybe why some of these, these cities and some of these states think they can get away with it in the way they do? Well, I think it's both of those. I mean, you, you very accurately predicted or, or described what happens. Um, a case like this, uh, it costs money for states to clean their voter rolls, and they hate to do it. 
Uh, they hate to spend the time and effort, and and that goes beyond partisanship and into just being <laughs> a bureaucrat limited by a budget. Um, but there are also uh, litigants waiting with partisan agendas who will sue to slow down this process, and we've seen that now for 30 years. Um, and there's also just the case that the Justice Department, which normally enforces this statute, is not interested in doing so. Um, you know, you can make a big difference if you are interested in doing so. We have what's called a, a standing as, as a private group to bring these lawsuits. And um, we used to joke at Judicial Watch that we were the uh, private Justice Department. But it, it really, there, there's some resonance to that. What the Justice Department should be doing is bringing enough suits that states are leery about dropping their obligations. Um, that's kind of, that's what we're doing. Um, you know, I, I look at settlements as a very hopeful and helpful sign. And that is that we are pursuing enough lawsuits in the right and asking the right questions that these groups, or I'm sorry, these states would rather settle with groups like us than go to the mat over it. That is typically the role that's played by the Justice Department. Normally, they come in with a lot of lawyers and a lot of money. Uh, we don't have a lot of lawyers, but um, you know, if you're willing to bring one of these suits and if you're willing to make a very simple case, you know, removing 22 people in a city of 5.5 million voters over a six-year period uh, on the ground that they've moved somewhere else without telling the state, uh, everyone knows that that's not how it ought to work. The the common sense of the situation dictates that they want to settle a case like that. And I'm very gratified that the officials at the New York City uh, board charged with uh, making these removals have agreed to start to do so and start to do so in significant numbers. And last like 15, 30 seconds here, this is something the Supreme Court did rule on, correct, back in 2018? Yes, well, what was interesting was that as soon as the law was passed, there was an arguable loophole that would have shut down completely the voter integrity side of the NBRA. And the Democrats argued in papers in Bill Clinton's Justice Department, Janet Reno's Justice Department, that this loophole was the correct interpretation. And it only got shot down in 2018, where the Supreme Court said, look, someone meets these criteria, they must be removed. And, um, you know, so uh, that was a victory, I would say, for <laughs> sanity in uh, uh, list maintenance. Well, Robert, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Congrats on the victory. Thank you for having me and uh, happy holidays.